them. They're part of my community. They're somebody that I can trust. And there's this kind of false sense of trust when you first connect with someone. And so you might be even more blinded to the signs of an unhealthy relationship than you would be if you were going about it in the traditional sense when you're meeting somebody on campus or you're connecting with them at a bar, the ways that we have known people to connect in the past. And so so knowing that we can kind of understand that there is this kind of blindness and this blind trust in people that we feel connected to through community. And when we meet people in person, often they expect something, they expect things to progress much faster because we might've been talking online for about a month before we even organize a date, before we even decide to meet up. And often again, you're sharing a campus and you're sharing a space. And so it's easier for you to meet up on campus. Oh, we live in the same dorm room or the same dorm building. So why don't we just watch a movie in my dorm? You live down the hall. Or why don't we connect at the dining hall and then we can hang out and watch a movie in my dorm. And so there's this boundary that's already kind of being blurred that we don't usually have when we're meeting people in person and when we're making that first connection in person. So we might be blind to not knowing how to communicate that we're not interested in moving forward with someone or moving too quickly with someone sexually when we are meeting up with them on that initial first date, which might be in somebody's bed, um, just watching a movie because that's the only place that you could sit in a dorm room. And so this situation that a lot of college students find themselves in is already set up for disaster and we're not set up with the tools to communicate um, or understand how to navigate a situation like that. So that's one thing to look out for. There's also when you think about kind of this age of social media and meeting online, there's this blurred boundary, too, with um, people asking you for photos or with Mm -hmm. people expecting you to respond to their messages within a certain amount of time. That's definitely something that I've noticed is a early indicator of toxicity or even later on abuse potentially. If you don't respond for 12 hours because maybe you were doing work or had homework or you just go to bed early, someone might get frustrated with you. And I think that's a sign of somebody who has way too high of an expectation of you to be communicating with them. And they think that you have an obligation to them and they feel a sense of ownership over you and of your response, that they are deserving of your response and your time before you even met this person in real life. Thanks so much. I mean, you've answered that so exactly. It's so brilliant. I think you are so spot on about it. Is that really that that sense of how quickly you start to get to know somebody is completely sped up by the fact that you've met them online. And we all know that we're probably more able to disclose more personal things about ourselves when we're not sitting face to face with someone. So what somebody knows is really crucial. So we often talk about like, you know, how early relationships progress and how that sort of interplays with what society tells us. So we know on one hand that society says, romance is everything every rom-com talks about the fact that this person becomes incredibly interested in you and wants to know everything about you and and all of the love and the stuff is amazing so how do we know the difference between that being healthy and then it becoming unhealthy is one question sort of to answer and the other one is let's start there actually what how do we know how can anyone really know the difference between this amount of attention is great before, before this attention doesn't feel right what would be some of the red flags that would be jumping up for you and your group of friends that's a great question and it, again it kind of goes back to that cyber culture that we're still defining because it's evolving constantly and we don't know what is and what isn't normal or acceptable um, in the digital age and in digital platforms we don't know how often it's appropriate to text someone or we have an expectation and it varies by generation as well um, a millennial might think that you should be texting you know once a day and that's fine and have an expectation that you're at work but somebody who's gen z who grew up with a phone might be expecting oh they didn't respond to me for an hour i feel like heartbroken and that's not that's not a normal feeling um but it is it is a real thing that is happening even though it's coming from an unhealthy place so that's that's one expectation kind of with that's also varying by generation but it is hard to tell love bombing is i you know we're going to talk about that a little bit more later defined really differently and interpreted really differently by people I've heard people say getting flowers is love bombing and that's not necessarily what I would define love bombing as and it's something that's such a new term um, and something that people are still trying to understand especially across generations in different ways because we have such different lives 
Um, we live so differently in in reality and in 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 a digital reality as well, in in VR even. And so trying to understand what is and what isn't unhealthy is so blurred and so varied person to person. That's so interesting. So, we, so we've recently done this great piece of work with Match Group and in turn Tinder about what healthy dating looks like. And we have some great like sort of health dating tips um, and really sort of unpicked how, how we can move from dating in the virtual world of sort of sharing information to how do you get into that like real world situation what do you need and what do you need so you know we have some great practical tips which are brilliant but I think the piece that we sort of don't talk enough about is how much of ourselves we disclose in those really those first early weeks and, and knowing each other you know you you're told that to get to know and have that really strong relationship you need to you know let go of a bit of information about yourself but we also know that from those that have experienced domestic abuse or intimate personal violence that abusers or those who choose to be abusive are like desperate for that information and the fact that they will dig deeper and deeper and deeper can feel like they're being really interested in us but scarily what they potentially will do is use that early disclosure of you know some of the challenges you may face or your fears as a way to manipulate and harm you later how do you manage that like as your group of friends because I think that's where we always land in this is that don't date in isolation always sort of let people know who you're dating because we know that the domestic abuse thrives in silence and that those that are choosing to be abusive want to pull you away from your close network how do we create that space amongst our friends to be like hey this is our standard what in the how, what, what are you doing with your group of friends around that it's definitely it's a difficult position to navigate especially at this age um i think in college people are still learning how receptive they are to feedback and how to be receptive to feedback in general even if it's just a comment on an essay from a professor let alone a comment on their relationship or their choice in who to pursue romantically it feels very personal often even though it's coming from a good place from your friends i think it can be taken Firstly, and it can be taken as a judgment being passed on on your taste. And so figuring out how to navigate that is important. And I've I've had friends who I've had to navigate that with, and I've probably been that friend who people have had to navigate it with as well. And I've found that what hasn't worked is telling them all of the things I'm observing and, and listing it off. Um, that that comes off as a past judgment of their partner who is someone they love. And you know, you hear when you're trying to support a survivor, your instinct might be to condemn that person that they're with and to condemn those behaviors but that's somebody that they love and so that's where it gets complicated with intimate partner violence is that we have to learn how to respect those feelings that might be really complicated uh, that are had by someone that you care about they they love that person or they might be falling in love with that person and to, so to respect that it's complicated to feel harm at the same time as feeling love uh, so something that I found that's really helpful is to say so I've just noticed one thing that feels a little bit abnormal. I could be totally wrong, but I've noticed that your partner has been doing this and I just, I haven't seen this happen in any other relationship. It's not happened to me. And so I just wanted to talk about how it might be making you feel, giving them kind of the opportunity to elaborate on it. And to an extent, it is, it is something that people have to come to accept on their own to make a conclusion on their own. And you can guide them to that conclusion but if you try to pressure them too hard into making that conclusion, you'll push them away and you'll push them deeper into that relationship. I mean, what, that's absolutely true. And what we also know is that those that are choosing to be abusive want you to, you know, want any opportunity, any excuse to isolate you from your friends. So if you're, you know, so if your friends are sort of saying, hey, this guy's behaving in a little bit dodgy way and perhaps he gets a little bit of, you know, knows about it, it's the perfect storm for him to be saying, well, your friends aren't supportive of our relationship. You know, they're, they're the ones that don't want to see you happy. They're the ones like, you know, challenging what we have. And obviously it's because you're, they're jealous because what we have is so beautiful, so intense. So I think you're spot on about like how you manage that is how you have those conversations. The other thing sort of which played up the other day is that I was had a great conversation with my girlfriends about how we've treated each other over our lives, um, over our different relationships and when they've been presented. And I think, you know, we sort of, I sat back and said to myself, you know, I've actually been a bit bad as a friend sometimes, and I own that, that I've been so, so invested in my friend's happiness that I've allowed them to explain away somehow the bad behavior of their partner. 
And fortunately, you know, the friend in particular I'm talking about hasn't, you know, the partner were not abusive or exerting power, you know, parent control in any way, but they were just not good partners. They behaved badly. But actually checking in with myself and saying, I've I've done, I've been a bit dismissive of of their experience and rather wanted them to be with someone over the fact of, you know, what's happening. And, you know, when you dig into like, why didn't he call? Is it 50 things that I've done? And But the reality is, is that if this person is not phoning you as a friend, I should be saying, if you don't feel safe or um, secure in your relationship, this isn't a healthy relationship. Um, and I suppose that's a challenge. And you know, we have sort of also looked at ourselves about the role that we have as friends. Um, and someone sort of suggested the other day, which I thought was really crucial, is that if you have this close knit group of friends, can you set a collective standard of who you will date and what healthy looks like? That's a great question. I I do think that friend groups kind of define their own subset of social norms. And it is it is possible for you to define what a healthy relationship looks like. But at the same time, we know when you get into those relationships, they're often unexpected. Um, and those behaviors come up not instantly, but but very slowly and subtly, which I know, again, we'll get into later, but the isolation doesn't happen overnight. And it's something you notice um, over time, someone being distant, and it could be a million things that's making them distant. It, it doesn't always appear that it's their partner. Um, and the partner could be somebody that you think is an amazing person, and you just don't see how it could be related to them. And so it's really difficult for you to define something, a standard across a friend group that everyone can uphold because it sneaks up on you. Like you said, it's it's so manipulative and it's so calculated often and so planned by the perpetrator that that you don't even know it's happening until until you've lost everybody in your life and there's nobody else to lean on except that person. And so it really is a difficult, I think, expectation to have of a friend group to be able to, to hold each other to that standard. But it is, I think, a useful standard to try and establish because if you were to establish that, then you can bring it up later in conversation with your friend and be like, you used to say like you felt this was really important in a relationship. And I'm just not noticing that this is consistent with your partner now. Do you feel like those standards have changed? I just want to understand where you're coming from. That opens a door for a conversation later. And so it is an important conversation to have. Is it a standard that can be upheld? I don't think so, but it opens a door for you to be there for that person later on. Oh, that's really key. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to open the question up to Drew, who's with us. Um, from a parent's perspective, um, you know, I will all have children, some of us will, some of us won't, but we'll all have younger people in our lives that we think that we, we're we responsible to some degree as aunts and uncles or caring adults. Um, from Drew, from your perspective, what can we sort of lay out and in, in what Ray sort of said about how do we how do we establish that healthy relationships with our young people? Um, <clears throat> so I would say, first of all, obviously everybody's different. Uh, we're, we're, formed by the experiences that we have, by the cultures that we grow up in. But especially when we're talking about what healthy relationships look like, and we're talking about young people, you know, we're not born with this knowledge. So to a very large extent, we what we're hoping to see is that we're hoping that young people have seen healthy relationship modeling, either in their parents or in older siblings. Now, in the absence of that, young people are very often turning to their peers to, to try and understand what is acceptable, what is healthy, what does that look like? And the reality is that their peers very often know just as little as they do. So in the absence of that information, we very often turn to our culture, including pop culture. And so if we're looking at movies, we're looking at TV, um, we're listening to, to music, uh, we're playing video games, Unfortunately, a lot of the messages that we get through our, through popular culture really, uh, they have some very unhealthy representations and they consider them to be, not only do they consider them to be acceptable, sometimes they consider them to be aspirational. Mm -hmm. So we have the, the, the trope of somebody, you know, uh, the boyfriend or girlfriend has dumped them and then they travel across the country to, to, to follow them you know, and, and engage in some grand gesture to, to show how, how much they care about them. And what, what we're doing is we're showing stalking behavior. So a lot of what we're learning, unfortunately, from, from popular culture, from our films and uh, TV and, and games, 
is, is very unacceptable. So where are we at? If we have parents that haven't it shown, you know, that they've not modeled what a healthy relationship looks like, and we have a culture that's giving us some really, uh, some really bad ideas about what is good and what is acceptable, that's when we start talking about, you know, potentially having schools involved. And that's one of the things that we've tried to do is, you know, we think just like we want uh, educators to be teaching um, other things that young people need to know in order to live happier, healthier lives. We think that healthy relationships and issues like consent, if they're not learning it at home from their parents, we should be learning that in, in schools. And that's part of the work that we try to do through our pro-social video games. So we try to provide free resources so that educators can provide this information. Because again, this is not intuitive. We are not born knowing this. And we are products to a great extent of our environment. So it's, I, I think it's a complicated issue. It's obviously there's a lot of nuance involved, but the reality is it requires a lot many different parties coming together, many different disciplines coming together in order to address these things. So it, there's no short answer, unfortunately, but I do think we have solutions. But part of what that involves is us recognizing the reality is that if we've not learned that as a young person by witnessing that in our parents, we're going to be, uh, we're going to have a challenge in terms of learning what that what that behavior should look like, what we what behavior we should be engaging in. You're so right, Drew. Thanks for that. And I think the message that I hear loudest in what you've said in a way is that we we put expectations on ourselves and many victim survivors will perhaps agree that we should have known differently when we met this abusive person. But the reality is is we've got exactly what you you know stated that is that we're not born with a perfect set of understanding around what healthy looks like in a relationship that is learned impacted by society but also that those that are choosing to be abusive will be creating an, many opportunities to try and exert power and control that is often very subtle separating few friends and family members so when you start in those early stages you can look back and you can think well i should have known differently but the reality is that you couldn't have known differently because that was the mo of the abusive person but also you were on the back foot anyway because we are very very few of us have perfectly formed healthy relationships in our lives that are great for examples in a way i just feel like it's important for us to pause and really dig into some of the two ter you know the terms that we use in the early stages love bombing and gaslighting because i know we use them flippantly you know we throw love bombing around as being something negative but exactly what you said ray that for different people that means different things that i hear a lot about gaslighting and to be truth like it's quite a hard concept to describe in a perfect definition but all of us will have experienced it at some points to be able to do so shall we jump straight into love bombing and ray do you want to lead on that and then we'll just have it yeah yeah absolutely um i, I definitely think it's it's great that we're talking about gaslighting as well but, but love bombing like we said is is kind of a individualized definition. It's interpreted different ways by different people. And I think going back to what Drew was saying, using education is so important because we can't expect people to adhere to a set of norms if there isn't one. And so we need an across the board definition for people of what is crossing that boundary. And then people can, can stretch that boundary as they please for themselves, but to have an idea of where, where that boundary does lie and where that line in the sand is drawn is so important to protect ourselves, especially from a young age. You know, we have we have barely any consent education, depending on the state we're in, at least in the US. I, I didn't learn about the word consent in school until I was 17 years old. And most people by that age are already sexually engaged. And so I, I didn't even know what lump bobbing was or to look for healthy relationships or unhealthy relationships. All I knew was that somebody had to say yes uh, at some point in, in sexual activity. And I knew that at 17 after people were mostly already engaged. And to talk about gaslighting is also so important to define what that looks like, because that's where it gets sneaky and is so subtle. It's something that happens so over time. And, and it goes into that kind of coercive bit of isolation that we were talking about earlier with relationships. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not something you instantly notice. It's something you notice once it's already been done and it's too late. And that's that's kind of what gaslighting is. It's it's this 
way that somebody is able to to trick you into to doing things like isolating yourself and to make you think oh well you never thought about how the the way that you're feeling right now that's so negative it's actually it's your parents fault um it's it's because your parents didn't love you enough and that's how they isolate you from your family and they they make you think that somebody else is responsible for the negative feelings that that person is putting on you themselves and it, it really does work because that's the person you love and you lean on and you spend the most time with and I think you're spot on on that is the fact that, you know, you you met somebody who was lovely and charismatic and all your friends la- liked and even potentially your parents or, you know, other family members. And they were great. Everyone else gets along with them brilliantly. But somehow me just being me is upsetting them and I'm causing the conflict in the relationship. So obviously it's me. And that constant sort of dialogue that this perpetrator is saying to you or the person who's choosing to be abusive is saying continues to play and play. And then they'll stack different things um, in your life that will sort of reinforce that. Sort of my best understanding of, of gaslighting is that constant undermining your sense of self. You know, you can have some really overt behaviors. They can, um, you know, move, move physically move things around to que- so that you start questioning your sanity all the way through to sort of doubting what you said in a situation or there's an argument that happened, like you said, and they undermine it. I suppose, um, Drew, I'd love to bring you in on this, is that as a parent, what do you think? Do you think these are things that are easy to see? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> big question you know, to give to you. <laughs> again, um, you know, it depends. That's always the answer. It depends, unfortunately, because the reality is that uh, not all young people have the same relationship with uh, a trusted adult or a parent or guardian. Right. So it, it does depend greatly on how, how comfortable is that young person per, person in having these conversations with with a parent, let's say, because, uh, you know, as tricky as this is for us to talk about as adults, mm-hmm. you know, I think back to when I was a teenager, these weren't conversations I was I would have been likely to have had with either of my parents. I would have been uncomfortable. I would not have wanted to, to have these conversations which of course then puts that young person at a disadvantage because they're left uh, fending for themselves. I mean, without question, you know, it's our support network that we rely on if we've got, you know, a partner that is that has an unhealthy need for power and control in that relationship. You need to rely on that support network in order to ground you, in order to bounce things off of them and say, is this acceptable, is this healthy? So to the extent that you're relying only on your parents for that, and you're not comfortable having those conversations with your parents, that's when I do think we have to explore other alternatives. That's not to say that that's not possible. Um, We do have, for example, one of our games is called Honeymoon. Mm -hmm. One of the things we like so much about that game, it's a game about healthy relationships. So, you know, many of our games are are about teen dating violence. So those are games when we're trying to spot the warning signs of, a, of an abusive relationship. But with honeymoon, the focus is more on we're in the honeymoon stage of this relationship, right? And things are, you know, the protagonist feels like everything is going really well. And what's, what's nice about that is we are able to, to exhibit some healthy relationship modeling through the game. And in this game, the game, the, this character is very fortunate because they have two parents who get along really well, and they're very close to both of them. So they have very open uh, conversations with them, open communication, which is lovely, but that doesn't necessarily reflect reality. But in playing the game, even if that's not your reality, you can at least see this is behavior, this is the style of communication that we should aspire to. Because in the game, for example, um, at some point, uh, the the partner starts uh, exhibiting some jealousy. And the protagonist is like, oh, mom, isn't this so so romantic? I mean, this, this person's really showing they care about me because they're jealous. And the mother's like, let me be clear with you. There's mm-hmm. nothing romantic about jealousy. This is, this is a problem. This is not something that you want to have happen. This is something that you need to be aware of because this potentially is a way that they're trying to exert power or control over you. Um, and similarly, with gaslighting and gaslighting, you know, it's become a very uh, common label and it's not always used a- accurately, 
But this is, uh, you know, really tricky because unlike more obvious forms of abuse, so, you know, physical or sexual violence, you know, this coercive control through psychological manipulation, psychological or verbal manipulation is really difficult to spot, especially if you're a young person. You have little to no uh, experience in terms of dating. And here's a person who is intentionally engaged in trying to get you to doubt your own sense of reality. Because the more that you doubt your reality, the more that you're relying on them to define what that reality is. And so not only does that undermine whatever relationship you have with your support network, that undermines your own uh, sense of who you are and, and, and what your reality is. And so it's really, it, it's a complex issue, but it's incredibly dangerous because once you get to that point, it's very, very difficult for somebody to pull themselves out. Um, so, I mean, I'm glad that we're having conversations about this. I'll just add that one of the games that we've had that has really resonated with a lot of like 11, 12, 13 year olds is a game about gaslighting. And it's a very lighthearted game. And I think that's part of the reason it's resonated with them. It's called Lamplight Hollow. Um, it's actually created by somebody in England and it's gone on to win other awards, but it's, it essentially takes place during a dream. Um, and so because it's in a dream, the, the player is a little more comfortable that this is not real. And in the game, you're just exploring different things. And it's not until you've played the game for a while that you learn the game is about gaslighting. And that's one of the ways we think that these complex, nuanced, sensitive topics, we do think that's a way to engage young people is by allowing them to explore these topics in a way that it would be unsafe to do in the real world. But in the game, they can experience an unsafe situation without any real danger to themselves. So yeah, love bombing, gas lighting, these are important, important terms, but you know, you could have hours long conversations about what these things mean to different people because there is so much nuance and complexity involved. Thanks. You asked, you know, I think you've hit on a really important thing in this is the fact that you're in that crucial time um, when you're a young person where you're wanting to rebel against your parents set of like rules and norms so they are no longer your sort of your safe space potentially and then this person this you know, this abusive person is is feeding into that at the same time and coupled with the fact that you have all of this messaging around like love bombing looking like romantic how you're defining it the terms are using quite frequently you know we've spoke quite extensively around young people's experiences of love bombing gaslighting and dating but we know that you know dating isn't only for that particular age group there are many of us that go through our entire adult lives dating some of us may have had significant relationships and sort of moved into the next one so I'm really chuffed to be able to welcome Pamela who's joined us and I'm going to jump to her for this question about what do you think it looks like in in you know in in later life dating around love bombing and and how you know we've had a, a bit of a chat about the role of friends and I've confessed to not always being the best friend at times I've always wanted my friends to be happy and not always recognized some of the the you know the, the messaging that we're saying that wasn't necessarily healthy what do you think from from your perspective I think that's an interesting question because um I think we present into relationships with all of our baggage mm -hmm. um so percent potentially you are showing up now at another stage in your life where you maybe feel more knowledgeable, but maybe don't really have um, quite a good understanding of some of these issues, you might start comparing to your previous relationship. So for example, love bombing as an example, it could be that your previous partner never did anything like that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden you have this attention this exactly maybe what you had dreamed for it in your first or you know other relationships right and um and and those might have not have worked for many reasons um including you know including abuse um not every you know person who abuse it, love bombs right mm -hmm. um so it, it might just be another series of tactics including somebody else knowing what has happened to you in the past Therefore, even having a bit more of ammunition mm -hmm. of what to, you know, say or do. 
I guess the other thing, um, you know, <laughs> feeling like a later in life uh, type of person, um, <laughs> is that, you know, it's, if you're kind of, you know, investing again, it's, it's gone wrong one time, which more likely you didn't want it to go wrong. So this is your shot. Mm -hmm. I think there's an added pressure of like, you know, this one will work or should work, or this is my time. Remember that there is, you know, a, a lot in, in, in terms of law bombing and, and even, you know, other, other forms, there is this idea of what is meant to be, what I believe is meant to be. And sometimes we engage in relationships like that, right? I meet this person who is amazing and we just click so much. We are meant to be. Mm -hmm. And we construct this own reality for ourselves. And then, um, you know, if it's a later in life case, maybe, you know, maybe this second shot is the one that is meant to be. Mm -hmm. And that means that you will invest harder. You will, you know, you will try to change the situation more. So I think... Um, uh, it it just presents a series of dynamics that it I think people might think that well you're more knowledgeable now like you'll get it like you could see the signs you have had this experience but no because you know all experiences are not the same so uh, not necessarily it might actually make us much more invested on making this work because we didn't the first time so we should make this second or third time work. I think that's really true, isn't it? It's the fact that you will. <laughs> been perhaps more giving or forgiving of certain situations because you're so invested and therefore you know that same thing about your friends around you might be cheering you on and, and hoping that you this is your person too and so not necessarily stepping in and saying things when they think it's unhealthy or or scary yeah. um you know and I think you know we've spoken a lot about what you know what love bombing what gaslighting looks like but I really just want to go back to something that Ray said really early on about the the pattern that the perpetrator may take on about isolation and what isolation looks like in those early stages of dating because we have two things going on one of them is we're like wow this person is amazing I want to spend all my time with them because they make me feel brilliant and I love it and I'm getting to know them and we're doing exciting things and you know this person loves to do rock climbing and I've suddenly become into rock climbing how does it move from being healthy to, to unhealthy a little bit and then to incredibly unhealthy. Like, what do we think that looks like? Ray, do you want to jump into stock? You were sort of mentioning it earlier on. Definitely. So I think, I think some of the really early on signs that you can see that are much more subtle are when somebody, maybe you're going out with your friends, just your friends. And, and especially in college, you might be posting that and your partner might be seeing that or your potential partner is someone you're you're just talking with at the moment and then they say oh well why wasn't i invited or wh why why are you going out do you want to meet other people and mm -hmm. and it's these little things that start to pressure you into oh well if i do this again i don't want to offend them or i don't want to alienate them and push them away from me like i like this person or maybe you're in a deeper relationship and it's like i love this person i don't want to lose them it seems like i might lose them if i keep doing this behavior that they're making you think is toxic when what they're doing is toxic. And it, it's little things that make a lot of sense in the moment because they're setting a boundary. You think it's healthy communication and it's not. But if you expect your partner to respect you, which you should, uh, you you respect their boundaries as well at the beginning. And so it's these little things that that start to build. And again, it's it, it just kind of feels like it gets it gets worse and worse and worse and then suddenly you have nobody around you because you're not allowed to leave without permission you're not allowed to leave your partner's house or, or bedroom even it can get so extreme because they'll be offended if you if you go outside if you're meeting other people if you're going to class with someone they don't like that you sit next to even they can stop you from they can hinder your education to an extent as well so, yeah, it's really interesting that, you know, the messaging that those abusive people choose, to, those people that choose to be abusive will do, that piece around, you know, what your behavior is making me jealous. And so my reaction to that is I control you more, but actually the implication that you have control over that is completely false. And in a way, it's like messing with your mind of, do I have control here? Like, am I making them jealous? But the fact that jealousy is attached to attraction and ownership and they really love me by this, how do we unpick that with 
yeah you know whether as parents or as young people or amongst our friends I mean Drew I know you do a great job through your games and obviously Pamela I'll, I'll extend the question to you to talk about you know where you're seeing with it but Drew please start um yeah so I, I'll say that uh, early on before we started creating these games uh, we first started we we partnered with the um it was the National Domestic Violence Helpline. At the time, we didn't have the Dating Abuse Helpline yet. And we coordinated with them to come up with the 10 warning signs of, a, of an abusive relationship. And one of them is that this is a person who blames you for the feelings that they're having. So it's your fault that I'm angry. You're responsible for this. You made this happen. So that's one of the warning signs. Um, and I think identifying these warning signs is helpful. Uh, you know, and that does not mean that this is necessarily an abusive relationship, but it does allow you to maybe highlight some some aspects of that relationship that have the potential to become unhealthy. I think it helps people to kind of draw the lines and create those boundaries, as, as Ray was mentioning. Um, but one of um, the games we've had that resonated really well is... Uh, part of what it brings in is this uh, bystander awareness. What does this young person do when their friend they think is in an abusive relationship? Because they know if I, if I call my friend and say, Hey, I don't think it's a good relationship. They understand that that friendship is at risk. Mm -hmm. So rather than, than do that, what they decide to do, this is a game called Grace's diary from 2010 created by a, a group of wonderful people in Thailand. Um, in Grace's diary, what Grace does is she looks through her room and she finds items that, that spark a memory of something that's happened in the past. And when she finds something, she finds an invitation to a party. So then you, you have a flashback to what happened at this party. And at this party, there was some behavior that was just unacceptable in terms of what happened to Grace's friend, Natalie. And Grace said, you know what, this is something important for me to note. So in her memo pad, she writes down the behavior that happened at, at that party. And after she comes up with several of these incidents, so specific incidents that were unacceptable in some way, they were unhealthier. Once she's got a list of these, then she's ready to get on the phone and have a conversation with Natalie. But she's not going to do it, just go off the handle and say, I think he's bad for you. Instead, she's going to say, you know, when this happened, this seemed like this was something that, that you weren't very comfortable with. This seemed like this was something that wasn't very good for you. And she's able to navigate this conversation because it is based on specific incidents that are then associated with unhealthy behaviors. So by tying those together, you're then able to navigate that conversation the game has three possible endings. And in one of those endings, her friend does leave this uh, a, a abusive partner, which is, is great. The other two endings are, they're not terrible endings, but she does stay with this person. So, and that game is really, it's a game that's really resonated with a lot of young people. And they've written reviews saying, I, if I'm writing something in all caps, that means I really mean it, please play this game right now which is wonderful because again, a young person is able to experience vicariously behavior or, or a, a, a situation that in the real world would be unhealthy for them to experience. So I think by knowing what some of the warning signs are, especially if you're somebody on the outside observing those things and then associating them to, to, to make the point that, look, if we connect the dots here. We think that there's, there's aspects of this that might not be really healthy for you. Thanks, Drew. I think you. I think that the theme is sticking to the fact that if you are that caring friend or family member or someone who's concerned, how you broach that subject is crucial. Um, and actually, how the fact that we're concerned can often play into the abusive person's sort of plan about isolation. Pamela, what are your thoughts on and how we talk about the isolation with our friends? I think that um, I'm going to come from another angle, which is we all come to a relationship with our own backgrounds, but our own cultural backgrounds. And we have to be very open. I know sometimes it's hard to talk about this, but it could be that there are myths that you've heard and grown up that are like very specific. I'm saying this because I, I was giving a training yesterday 
and um and 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 this group was talking about this and there's this one around jealousy it's certainly you know where i grew up and and so forth and and therefore it's you know um we know these kind of things happen in other places is the myth around jealousy which is the more jealous he is the more he loves you mm -hmm. if he's not jealous he doesn't love you so you almost have to be grateful because this man is really, you know, looking after you because he's jealous. If he's not jealous, he's just not interested. And the problem with this kind of myths or things that we hear from a young age is that for some reason, you know, they they embed, of course, and so we believe them. So when we when we have somebody who, you know, as Ray was saying, in the first stages are displaying some signs of jealousy, I think it's love. Mm -hmm. it just validates my sensation that I am with the right person because he cares for me because I come with all of this um, stories that I have been told or heard or grew up with. So I think it's very important for every person to also try to understand and their background around these issues, the things they heard when they were little, their own communities. It could be that you grew up in a, you know, in a very kind of church community and they would have some things that would say it could be that, you know, so it, it doesn't only come with your kind of own personal background, but just the way that you grew up and what those myths were. So whenever we talk about like working on, on ourselves, you know, I, 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 you know, everybody says that, and 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 I always ask, like, what what do you what do you mean? Um, give somebody a way to start that process. But one of the things is definitely knowing the things that you grew up with and the things that influenced you to try to understand what your response will be. Um, and so isolation could be that, right? I'm spending a lot of time with this person. He really, really cares about me. Um, they're giving me all the time, right? If I'm so special and so coveted. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to add that just to make sure that we kind of get to know ourselves a little bit to know which one of these tactics we might be more prone or vulnerable to. I mean, I think that's really, it's a really key point, isn't it? And especially if we're, like you mentioned, like have traveled through life and had multiple relationships and start to sort of think about what that pattern is for us um you know who we are as a person with that relationship and how we you know support our friends and families to affirm that person is really key and I think it's a very um sort of dismissed role that we do as friends if you can empower your friend to be the best version of themselves and love themselves and you know work out who they are and who they want it's crucial without adapting and, and sort of going forward with it um I suppose we've talked about love bombing and gaslighting and jealousy, you know, and I often think about those early stages of relationship, how we have this need, you know, this desire to know each other really well and, and sort of our, you know, as we move from that point in that relationship, we move into the later stages and you may get to a point where you're moving in with this person and <clears throat> they're in, you know, they are overtly abusive and you can, can clearly identify the behavior and you look back and you say, should I have seen the red flags? What red flags did I miss? And part of me wants to say that, well, you wouldn't have seen them because the person who's choosing to be abusive is excellent at hiding them. But I think, you know, it's good for us to pause on it in a minute because as friends, family members and those closest, like what can we see from the outside that potentially someone from within that relationship is less likely to see? And how can we respond? Um, Ray, do you want to start Perfect. us off on this? Intense? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to repeat myself too much because I think I've given a couple, but I have a different one that I think an outsider can really easily notice, or, or you can notice reflecting back. But as, as you've mentioned, it's, it's really something that you can't identify in the moment, uh, too well, usually at least from somebody that you care about. But when the person, when your partner is speaking negatively, um, even if it's very subtle things about the people that you care about, even, even your coworkers, um, your friends or, or your family members, and, and they're saying, oh, well, I don't like the way that that's your roommate talks to you or told, just told you to take the trash out. I don't like the way that they just spoke to you. And it's something you didn't even notice because it wasn't there truly. There was no negative intention, but they're trying to to lay a seed to later isolate you. I think that's a really early attempt at isolation. And they're kind of feeling the ice and how thin it is and how easy it will be to to break it for you with that relationship and to kind of break that tie. And, and it can be so, so subtle again. 
It can be, I don't like the way your mom just texted you back. They shouldn't, they should have acknowledged something you said differently. And it's, it's, it's just trying to lay that seed. And that's something that you can notice at reflecting. And if you know that it's something to look for, I think it's something that you can notice in the future yourself. But as a friend, if this person starts coming to you, the person in a relationship and they say, well, my boyfriend didn't like the way that you treated me the other day. That's, that's a sign. And that's something that's, I think, very common to hear from somebody in an abusive relationship is they say, my boyfriend thinks this, my boyfriend thinks that. Uh, you start hearing every opinion come out of their mouth and it's related to the opinions of their partner and not related to their own. They start they start losing their agency in, in every judgment that they pass in the world that they're existing in. Even if it's, oh, well, like my boyfriend doesn't like the city. So I'm thinking I want to move to the suburbs later. I used to like the city. It's They start losing interest in things because they start adopting all of the same perspectives as their partner. Mm-hmm. I mean, what you that's hoping? a very sorry that's a very good one I just I just have to jump in that's a very good one and I think um I think I, I the only thing I would add to that is when it is too much so I think love mommy if it's happening I think it's quite easy to see and I think what stops friends sometimes is thinking oh maybe she's lucky and I'm just being jealous um, because she found this fantastic boyfriend um, who's doing very nice things. Um, and maybe, you know, and so a lot of people, I think, stop there. Um, but kind of recognizing that if you have a feeling that too much is too much, it's because it probably is. So I would say as a friend, trusting your gut um, and always being honest um, and just, you know, giving that space for people to to come to you. But I think that one is an easy one to see um, for sure, because somebody might from one day to another change, as Ray was saying, um, or the relationship might just seem so absorbing Mm -hmm. that you don't have your friend anymore. But you might you need to get over that part of like, am I just being, you know, a bit jealous or a bit, you know, I'm just jealous because I'm losing my friend. Um, Be able to recognize that, too. As you're right, it's sometimes that when we're going to have to have, you know, we're spurred to have these conversations as a risk to us as friends as well. Will we mm. will we be misconstrued? Will we, will we be accused of sort of not being supportive or jealous? And, you know, jealous is a big word. It has lots of negative connotations and so it can prevent us. Drew, what are your thoughts? There's a lot to talk about here. That's what, that's what my thoughts are. Uh, so what I'll do is I, I think I'll, I'll step back a little further and t- talk a little more broadly about um, maybe some protective factors that help young people and all of us, but especially young people, be less likely to be accepting of abusive behavior and also be less likely to be a perpetrator of abusive behavior. So these are you know, protective factors taking a, a public health approach and they include things like media literacy. So mm-hmm. for example, those messages that we are bombarded with, if you have a background in media literacy, if possibly in middle school or high school, they've taught you, hey, you know, let's really examine the messages that we're being told in this movie or in this commercial or in this song. If we explore the, the intentionality behind these, and then think about the impact that has on us, then maybe that will give us a little more power to not be as influenced by them. But uh, an- another protective factor would be resilience. So the- these are those you know, attributes or traits that make it that more likely that when we are harmed by either this partner or by previous partners and we've experienced trauma, it makes it more likely that we will be able to bounce back, which sounds a little more, a little more optimistic than it really is, but that's, you know, to make us thrive. So resilience, um, media literacy, critical thinking is another one. So, you know, we have these preconceived ideas of, of what we think uh, is truth or what we think is acceptable. If we're, if we're a critical thinker, we try and leave those things at the door when we evaluate them. So if, if I've learned all my life that this certain behavior, let's call it jealousy, is, is acceptable, if we're a critical thinker, maybe we, we put those preconceived notions to the side and we explore it um, from a, you know, a, a critical thinking approach where we are not as engaged with 
our preconceived ideas about that. Instead, we have distance from that and we look at things as they really are from critically. So these are, I think by, by, by kind of supporting and, and fostering those, those qualities or traits that are protective factors broadly that will help us not only wind up in healthier relationships, but also be less likely for ourselves to, to, to become perpetrators of, of violence. So I, I, I think taking a step back is, is sometimes helpful in, in using this public health approach for violence prevention. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you, Drew. I think the other, just before, I'm just conscious that we've, we've only got so much time left. I think one of the things that always jumps out for me is how um, financial abuse can start very early on in a relationship. And often we, you know, we expect to see it as you start to live together or even, you know, that you've entered a more serious stage. But actually those early stages is where those seeds are sown. And for, for many of those that are in that, it's difficult to unpick, but often takes on the form of, I will do these things for you because it will help you out financially, which means that you will willingly surrender some set of control over your finances. That could be things like, oh, let's let's pool all of our money each month and we can use so much for spending money. Or can I have access to how much your money you're spending or help you budget? So it's those early seeds of sowing um, around economic abuse or financial abuse that can start within the dating stage that you know, friends or those closest that may not see, but it's often not something we talk about. I just heard today that over 30% of us will never talk openly about our finances and some of the challenges we may or may not have with those closest to us. So it's the perfect storm in a sense for those that are choosing to be abusive to be able to, to get into that space. I am again conscious of time and I want to allow some space for our questions, but before we jump into that and for those that need to perhaps leave us, I just wanted to say thank you, um, for joining us and that if you are interested in what um, following us through with the series our next series will our next episode sorry will be the end of next month and we'll focus on interpersonal violence and sexual um violence and really digging into how sexual violence occurs with an interpersonal relationship so again if you've signed up for this one you should get the link for that please follow us through and you can view it on social media and a massive thank you um before we jump into the questions to drew and Ray and Pamela, who were so kind to join us through um, a little bit later on, but through a craziness of traveling um, in South America. So just want to open up questions. I think there's some really, really crucial one. The first one comes from um, a survivor who was asking, when should they tell somebody that they've experienced domestic abuse? Is there a right time to tell them and is dating the right time? Um, Pamela, I'm gonna jump to you first and then offer it out to everyone. I think that whenever they feel it's right to tell somebody, mm -hmm. um, because it, it's such a it's such a difficult disclosure, um, because we don't set into relationships um, with the idea that we're going to end in an abusive relationship. So um, by telling that first person, we're confronting the reality of the situation that we're facing. We might be thinking it already, but it is the first time that most likely we are talking. So I think you have to be um, emotionally prepared to say it and also to receive uh, the feedback that you're going to hear, right? Um, and you might you might not be on, on that front, but I think uh, it is, I don't feel there is a right time if the time is not right for you. Mm -hmm. um, it's whenever you feel comfortable, whenever you feel safe, maybe because safety could be in jeopardy too. Um, so I think, um, I, I think there's no right time. I think um, if you start believing that you might be in an abusive situation, maybe you're dating only, and you start seeing some little things that you don't um, like, um, then you know, obviously your most trusted friends, family, people that have always been with you um, could be, you know, um, the right, but I, um, I also would say getting information, reading, uh, becoming literate about the issue, um, there is so much out there that that might help. But in terms of, of sharing this, I think that is deeply with the hands of, of the survivor. Um, Drew or Ray, would you like to share your thoughts on it? Is there anything you'd like to add? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all I'll say is I, I think when you know, you know, which is usually a term that comes up in a more romantic context. But I, I really do believe there's like a moment 
at least that I've experienced as a survivor when I'm seeing someone new. I, I just know that it's the right time to tell them and I feel safe with them. It's just when it feels like safest and when it feels right and you'll something clicks in your head, I think. Mm -hmm. That's really key. There's also the notion that you don't have to tell everybody everything all in one go. So you can tell moments of your story until you feel more comfortable, a little bit like an onion. Let it like each layer go, the more safe and secure you feel. Um, and there's no, yeah, and like echoing what everyone else has said, when you're ready, you're ready. And you know that you know that you know because it's in your gut. Next question, really interesting one, and one that came up um, probably quite recently between um, celebrities' response to allegations of abuse. But how do we differentiate between boundaries and control? Um, I don't know if we want to, how many want to jump in first around this? Well, that's a, that, um, of course, that is a, that is a hard one. I I think um, this is the, the same uh, on the same line of you know when do you know it's domestic violence or you know or not I think um, whenever you feel that you are under control um, when you know control is being exerted over you then you know this is crossing the line from maybe um, let's say that somebody is you know has always thought about money very carefully. Right. And, you know, they, they just look after their money and that's, that's, that's them. That's their personality. But when they're starting to look after your money and not giving access to your money, then, or trying to control what you spend, then maybe that's beyond their boundary, right? They're controlling you already. They're controlling your finances. So I think, um, you know, this is the same, uh, as I said, the same example with domestic violence, um, um, in, in the kind of, you know, physical uh, space and saying, somebody say, you know, I've thrown a plate down in anger. Well, you know, unfortunately, I know we all have, you know, an anger kind of spout um, in a moment. But the question is, does your partner think that you're going to grab that plate and throw it to them in their face? And will they expect that to happen again and again and again to the point where fear is created? So fear being this kind of, you know, a denominator, right? Of, you know, just not, you know, a a moment, a, a really, you know, bad moment. So I think, um, yes, when control is being exerted, you're going over that boundary. Mm -hmm. Ray, do you have any thoughts? Anything I think about? I think Drew said it really well earlier that when you start to feel this sense of you are responsible and being made to be responsible and being blamed for feelings that your partner has for things that are inconsistent with something someone would have been upset with you for doing in any other previous relationship that you've had or in one that you've previously identified to be toxic. Like if you are going out and somebody is making you feel like you are doing something wrong to them and truly betraying them and you feel the sense of blame that feels inconsistent with your idea of what you should be blamed for in a relationship, that's when you kind of know that that boundary is no longer a boundary and it, it's control. I, 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 I mean, I agree. I, I would just add that if, if you start to get a sense of, you know, what people refer to as walking on eggshells, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not just a matter of, oh, you know, this is something that I know from their past is an issue for them. But instead, you're actually feeling like, okay, if I don't do things the right way right now, then I know that this is going to, we're going to go from this kind of honeymoon phase, we're going to go into the really abusive, violent phase, you know, because that's part of that cycle of abuse, where you've got this sense of walking on eggshells. So I, I, at least for me, I think that that's one way of identifying that this is not just respecting their boundaries, this is actually problematic. But, you know, part of what that requires is that you, that means you've experienced it some number of times, because otherwise you don't have that feeling that you're walking on eggshells. Mm -hmm. So it's not a really good answer for the very first time you're experiencing it. But once you are in that cycle, I think that's one way of identifying it. Thank you. I'm just like, I'm also thinking that the way to sort of spin that question for yourself is what would healthy look like with regards to boundaries and potential um, you know, in a control. Like I always think to myself that it's absolutely okay to set boundaries within relationships, but it's how equal those boundaries are and how equally respected they are from both sides. Um, and actually acknowledging that my boundary that I set shouldn't hinder or 
prevent somebody or the person that I'm with from having the best quality of life and the best opportunities and accessing everything. If their boundaries are hindering your, your ability to have a great life or meet friends or those types of things, then it sort of in a way blurs into that gray area of control. And then it becomes this way again of like gaslighting this process of, well, you've crossed my boundary. That's where my reaction is like this. And therefore it is your fault. You're definitely in the abusive control space. Um, very difficult. Two last questions, really simple one for you, Drew, about your games. Are they just for young people or can they be used by everybody of all ages? So they could be used by all people of all ages. There are two games that do have content warnings and we say we don't want young people playing those until a, a trusted adult has played the game and said, yeah, this is acceptable for you. Some of the games are geared toward younger people, but we have, for example, a game uh, that involves uh, the player going through the Title IX process on a university campus. So broadly, we're focused on 11 to 22 year olds but some of the games are engaging and, and challenging enough that people of all ages would want to play them. I uh, will say that the past few years, our games have focused more on the protective factors. So for example, we have two uh, critical thinking games and they have a lot of puzzles in them. So I think people would enjoy those and they really don't have anything at all to do with healthy relationships. The idea is just to foster uh, critical thinking skills. Um, similarly, uh, our, we have four resilience games that we've published. And those, again, those are for uh, younger people, but not very young. But again, the, the, the idea behind them is to help foster skills so that people are, are, are more resilient. And that applies to people of all ages. Um, and since the games are free, we encourage people just to try them out. One thing I will add is that that's something that we tell parents. So let's say that a parent wants to talk to their child about consent. They're like, I don't necessarily feel like I have the, 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 the background to do that. It's like, look at our consent games, play through them, find one that you think will resonate with your child and say, now go take this game, go off on your own privately. So I'm not looking over your shoulder, go play this game. After you've played the game, we can come together and have a conversation. So there is an opportunity for parents to, to play these games, if nothing else, just to identify the games that they think would be best to engage their kids about these sensitive topics. Thank you. Before we go, one final question, and it's a difficult one to answer because everything, you know, depends on the people you're talking to, but what is the one thing you would do to enable you to have a conversation with someone that you're concerned, who's in a relationship that you're potentially concerned about? What would the environment look like and potentially what would that first statement sentence be? <laughs> I'll give you a moment to think. I think for me, it's always, it's always, it's not the one time that counts for me. It's being consistently open to conversations and being present when someone may talk about it. And knowing that if you are experiencing abuse in any shape or form, you're probably not going to name it as that and will come across in a different way. Sometimes about sort of uh, affirmation questions or my partner did this, what do you think? Or what did your partner do in that space? And being able to answer those and knowing that it could take months for someone to fully ask for that bit of help. So I've sort of said, given you a chance to think, Pamela, jump in. No. <laughs> and then... I, what I've said um, um, in the past when I've seen this, and this is what I, you know, I, I, I try to advise is quite straightforward and asking people, are you okay? Mm. Um, especially they're close like are you okay and then people might say no um yes but why are you saying so I, mm. I know you well and you don't it doesn't seem like it's okay but you know that if anything is happening you can come to me especially when I don't have information uh, about like it, it, it's it's just a gut feeling I'm just getting the sensation I don't really have evidence um that this person is being abused so I think I the the straightforward forward question of are you okay? Which you can do to anybody in any situation, all fairness. Um, and just being honest, saying, I just don't see you. Um, okay, but it might be me. But if anything is happening, you can come to me at any time and leaving that door open. So that that would be my, I think there's a share of a little bit of honesty, you know, can go away because it could be the first time that that person is, knows that they're not able to cover it as they think they are covering it. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
just that prompt might give them some idea that it's that, that moment that we were talking with Ray and Drew, that moment where it comes, it, it might be near when mm -hmm. they need to talk. Ray. I don't know that I would change that too much. I think that was really well said, but I think I think leading with active listening and just just always being somebody who's there for your friends in every situation and being somebody who is there to listen and not to tell someone what they need to be saying is so important because if you give them an idea of what you want them to say, they're going to just completely shut down and they're not going to be open with you. And so so just being an open ear and then having an open door kind of to your friend at all times, like Pamela was saying, is is all that you can do in the end, um, mm -hmm. or is the most important thing that you can do as a friend, and then the most empathetic thing. Drew, anything from you? You know, I agree. I, I love Are You Okay? Because that obviously applies to many situations other than just unhealthy relationships. That's about being a good friend and letting them know that you can communicate with them, they can talk with you, that they feel safe doing so. So it feels like a safe space, feels like it will be uh, free of any judgment. And if, especially if you're a younger person and you're wondering how to approach this, frankly, I would call a helpline and ask for their advice and give them the specifics and allow the people who are you know, trained to provide this advice to give me some feedback so I know how to proceed. Thanks, Ruth. I mean, well, you've you've said something so perfect and actually really lovely way for us to close the session is that as that friend, family member, or caring adult, it is sometimes really difficult to manage the disclosure um, of domestic uh, abuse or intimate partner violence and knowing what you do with that information for yourself is also really crucial. You don't need to respond um, in a way that you, you are giving practical advice or suggestions. There's advocacy services across the country and across the world that do that excellently. And actually, if you can see your role as being the bridge to that um, agency, you've done the right thing. Um, you know, listening without judgment and the power of just believing somebody is really, really crucial when someone does make that disclosure. Um, so I'm just going to, I know we've gone over a little bit and I wanted to do that so we can answer some of the questions, although there are some other great questions we've not been able to reach. I want to say a massive thank you to Ray and to Drew and for Pamela for starting this really interesting conversation. And for those that have joined us who are survivors and are sort of thinking about some bigger questions around when do I start my next relationship, we um, at No More have been blessed to develop a survivor's guide with a group of survivors. Um, it's available on our website and it really sort of digs into some of those things about when you would feel ready to move on and what you could sort of have ready for yourself and the conversations you'd have with those closest to you. We have a great set of um, healthy dating guidelines that we've created with Match Group and Tinder, which talk about dating online and the sort of dating in real life. We did, you know, access those, use them as a conversation starter with your friends. It's really great. And then again, um, this, this is the second episode of our Global Dialogue series. If you've signed up, you should be able to see it via the same platform you're viewing it now. However, it's also available on our YouTube channel, along with all of our other sort of episodes and of bits and bobs that we've done. And you'll be able to access that via um, the links that will come out to you or if you just search and via our social media. The other thing to consider is you're based in the US or in the UK or some of our other sort of countries around the world, you can access an app called Bright Sky. Um, it's free to download. It's also a web page, but that provides some useful tools and suggestions about how you can um, respond to those that are closest to you and also provides directory of services, that crucial piece of information between someone telling you and linking them to that specialist service, the Bright Sky app or domesticshelters.org's website, along with our global directory if you're outside of the US or UK, provides all of those services in a simple space. Um, again, a, mess a massive thank you for those that have joined. Um, you know, your questions are part of and, and we'll continue to form the, the series as we go along. So thank you. And again, thanks to Drew, Ray and Pamela for joining and we'll see you again next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.